Today, it is my immense pleasure to present to you my conversation with the wonderful Dr. Mary Claire Haver. She is a board certified obstetrician and gynecologist. She's a menopause expert. She's an author. She wrote the book, the fantastic book, The Galveston Diet. And she also has a presence here on YouTube. She is on TikTok. She is on Instagram. I'm of course going to link all of that down below because she is a wealth of information. I've written a couple of blogs to go along with this video. One of them is essentially a transcription of my interview with Dr. Haver. Now I did that because I want you to be able to just sit and listen to her and not worry about writing things down or taking notes or doing anything like that. I basically took all those notes for you and virtually verbatim have it over on a blog. Now the second blog that I wrote is essentially my journey so far with menopause and how I am applying the kind of five bucket menopause toolkit strategy. And I thought it would be a great resource for you as well to possibly apply to your own life. Of course, in your own way, because we are each, you know, individual and different. I really hope you're having a great day. I'll see you on the other side. If you could just introduce yourself for the audience, for people who do not know who you are, that would be wonderful. So my name is Dr. Mary Claire Haver. I am a board certified obstetrician gynecologist. I practice medicine in the states of Texas and Colorado. And since 2018, I've really done a deep dive into menopausal medicine. And in 2021, I opened my menopause care only clinic uh, outside of Houston, Texas. I have a fair amount of followers across social media, and I really am excited to be part of this movement and wonderful that I get so much time and attention spent on menopause um, throughout social media. I really, really appreciate what you do because I'm going to be 50 this year. And I know for me, even in the last couple of years, I was really pretty clueless to all of it. The lack of understanding or the or the amount of misinformation is really great. So in that, we have collected a ton of questions from my community, and I would love it if you could answer these. We're just going to fire away. First of all, why should women in perimenopause slash menopause uh, consider taking HRT? Certainly, if you are having severe side effects that are disruptive to your life, if you're having kind of the classic symptoms of night sweats, sleep disruption, mental health disorders, but a, a lot of the symptoms women don't realize, and even healthcare providers don't realize, have a very strong menopause correlation. Things like joint pain, muscle pain, skin changes, hair changes, nail changes. You know, there is not an organ system that is effect, not affected in your body. But what if you are one of the lucky small percentage of women who really don't notice any difference other than your period stop one day and you feel fine. Well, we know that menopause is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease, as well as Alzheimer's and dementia. And it turns out that women who start hormone therapy early in their journey, meaning within in perimenopause or within the first five to 10 years of their period stopping, we'll see a decreased risk of cardiovascular disease and neurodementia as they age, mm. as well as stronger bones and, you know, less chance of osteoporotic fracture, which no, I re really need to talk about this, you know, and what happens when you break a hip and mm. your quality of life and your chance of death skyrockets. And this is so preventable and hormone therapy goes a long way for those chronic diseases. So why are so many doctors so ill-informed about HRT? Why so much confusion, fear, uncertainty, and doubt? So, and I was part of that. And so I can really speak honestly about it. Um, in 2002, the Women's Health Initiative study was abruptly ended um, because they found that the estrogen and progesterone only arm had a increase what they found to be an increased risk of breast cancer in the participants that took it. That was a shot heard around the world. They went into a very famous ballroom and called a press conference. It was a, just a small handful of the dozens of investigators in this study. They brought in news cameras. This was before social media. So 2002. Right. And it was on every major news station. It was on all the morning talk shows. It was the cover of, it was the biggest health story of 2002 right. was estrogen causes breast cancer. And that abruptly stopped 80% of all hormone therapy prescriptions, stopped future prescriptions of hormone therapy. And that kind of locked into people's minds. Now that study has been 
I don't want to say disproven, but those findings have been re-examined, walked back. It was grossly overestimated. It was, you know, so many things have been just removed from that study. We have learned some important things from it. I don't, you know, I think it was an important study, but but we we didn't have a news conference for that, you right. know. And in our continuing, at least from the OB Gen world, which is my specialty, when we look at our CME every year, continuing medical education in order to keep up our board certification. It's tons of stuff about fertility and getting pregnant and staying pregnant and, um, you know, pediatric gynecology, lots of new groundbreaking surgical techniques, all important stuff, oncology, a lot of things on dis disparities amongst gender and race and, and all these important things. There is never, almost never, a menopause article, which means there's no real research being done in menopause. There's a huge gap in how we were treating and training residents on how to take care of a menopausal patient. Yeah, that's incredible. I wonder though, if it'll shift now. I mean, because I, I feel like there's a tidal change happening and maybe it's just because I'm focusing on it. Maybe it's because of my age, but I, I genuinely feel like there is that tipping point that's starting to happen. And honestly, it's got a lot to do with people like you that are just shouting from the rooftops, but it feels like at some point they can't keep not doing anything. I mean, you can't. So just like in politics, I mean, a lot of this is political, right? The right. money that goes into research from the NIH, National Institutes of Health, it's, it's very, very political. We have to fight for it. Yeah. We have to prove, we have to have numbers on our side. We have to show that interventions can actually make a difference in the quality of a, and life, the health and lifespan of a woman's life. And so this generation, our generation, I'm 54, I'll be 55 next month. We are not willing to take this anymore. We are not willing to go gracefully into older age. You know, whether you choose or not to have hormone therapy is, is it's, that's a personal decision, your body, your choice, right? But you will deserve the informed conversation about it. And we, it's a big ship to course correct. And I, I mean, it is, it's going to take years, but, and we're on a bit of a wave right now. And I just pray that this is just not a tidal wave and people get work with it. You are going to have to advocate for yourself and you're going to have to fight in some instances. And I'm doing everything I can to spread resources and information on how to do that. Okay, so what are the different options for HRT in the United States? Well, great. Um, I practice here in the U.S., and I know some of your followers are in other countries, so I'm going to try to speak in kind of generic terms. You can take some of this information back where you come from. So basically, most of the research that has been done has been centered around hormone replacement. So let me give everybody a brief primer, because I think it's important right. that you understand what menopause really is. It's not some magical, mystical time in your life. Mm -hmm. We are born with our ovaries intact and all of our eggs. Men are different. The testicles make sperm every day, fresh, right? They're constantly recreating new gametes. We are born with all of ours and they begin deteriorating when we are in the womb at five months. So 20 weeks of pregnancy, mm -hmm. they start dying off, okay? And that dying off process, it doesn't matter when you go through puberty or if you've had birth control or contraception, doesn't matter, okay? We start ovulating at puberty. We stop ovulating at the end of menopause. We stop ovulating when we run out of eggs. Huh, yeah. When you spit out your last viable egg, you are done and there's no bringing it back, okay? That mm -hmm. is what menopause represents, the end of ovarian production of hormones. And they're not gonna come back yet. There's some, there's some new, new work being done there. Okay, so when we talk about treatment of this, the number one treatment, that's going to work the vast majority of the time for the most amount of people is to give you back what those ovaries made. Okay. So okay. what did the ovaries make? Estrogen. Okay. Which surges. So when we talk about hormone balance, that's a lot of marketing. Remember it's pulsatile. Mm -hmm. Estrogen production in your normal reproductive years goes up and down each month, right? In a normal cycle. It's not everybody has normal cycles. And then following the estrogen peak, we have a progesterone peak. Okay, so our ovaries mostly make estrogen and progesterone. We do make some testosterone. We make about 10% of what a man makes. Half of it comes from the ovary. The other half comes from the adrenal gland. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about hormone replacement for a woman, we talk about estrogen plus or minus progesterone. And then in a separate conversation, we can talk about testosterone. But let's focus on estrogen because that's really when we're talking about bone health, mental health, you know, the, what the studies are showing, it's all on estrogen replacement. So there's multiple forms of estrogen on the market in the U.S. 
Um, there's the original, the, you know, it, I've, I have a book coming out about this, mm -hmm. so I don't bore everyone, but you know, the big first one that came out was Primer, which was pregnant Mary urine that pulled the estrogens out of their urine. There's about 10 different estrogens in there. It was used forever. It's still on the market today. I never prescribe it. One, because I have better options, I feel like. Two, because I don't like ethically what they do to the horses to get mm -hmm. the, you can research that on your own. Mm -hmm. So I prescribe estradiol. That is my number one go-to for my patients. Unless she can't tolerate it, we have to look for something else. Okay, estradiol is what your ovaries made. So in the, another marketing term, you need to kind of tiptoe around is body identical or bioidentical. In the US, it means different things to different people. So I try to use language around, I'm trying to give you back what your ovaries used to make in the same chemical compound. So, so there's also ethanyl estradiol, which is synthetic. And it's in what's most, it, it is what is in the majority of birth control pills. I do see a push in oral contraception going to pure estradiol. Mm -hmm. but these pills have been around forever. And it, that's another ship to course correct right. at a time. So, so for menopause therapy, now the difference between a birth control pill and menopause hormone therapy is dosage. In birth control pills, we have to suppress ovulation. So you don't spit an egg out and you don't get pregnant, Right. Menopause hormone therapy is a fraction of that dose. We're just trying to give you enough to keep you healthy, not to, not to suppress ovulation that isn't happening anymore. Okay. Okay. So, um, when we talk about progesterone, again, I try to stick to oral micronized progesterone, which is the safest way to deliver progesterone. There's a great study that came out of France, about 80,000 patients as far as breast cancer. And they looked at different types of progestins in the different menopausal hormone therapy and the chances that they would be associated with breast cancer. And I mean, it's an observational study, but the oral micronized progesterone, which happens to be body identical, had the lowest risk. So that's kind of my go-to, estradiol plus progesterone. So how do we get it in your body? Tons of options there as well. We can do oral or non-oral. When we do non-oral, that could be transmucosal, like a trochee or uh, something through the vagina, a cream or the brain, or you can do transdermal, again, creams and um, patches mm -hmm. and a gel. Um, I try to stick to FDA approved options for a number of reasons. Number one, I know what's in it. Mm -hmm. Got a 93% chance when they test it. It's exactly what they say it is. Number two, and then when you do that for compounding, it's only about a 40 to 50% chance. There's a lot of leeway, you know, and there's they're not doing third party. There's no third party testing and compounding. There is, um, it depends on the quality of the pharmacy that you're getting. Uh -huh. So, um, so oral and estrogen carries an increased risk of blood clots and potential blood pressure elevations. We can negate that risk and take you back to your baseline with a transdermal option, with a non-oral option. So your creams, your gels, anything that goes through the skin or the mucosa are gonna have lower risk for those conditions. So for that reason, I stick with a patch usually for estradiol is my preferred method. Progesterone creams can be compounded, but it's a very large molecule. They vary erratic absorption through the skin. No one in my world feels like a progesterone cream is going to be enough to protect the lining of the uterus from endometrial cancer, which is why we do it for most patients. What are HRT estrogen and progesterone made of? So if it's if it's estradiol, it's usually a plant derivative. Um, they'll they're everything goes to a lab. So don't think that there's nothing synthetic going on. Um, but it's usually coming from something high in phytoestrogens, like you set soy <laughs> or yams, mm -hmm. yes. um, yes. where they basically take the phytoestrogen and break bonds and make new bonds to create okay. the estradiol, which is body identical. Next question is, should I use HRT if I have zero menopause issues? And you kind of covered this before, but I think this is worth repeating. Never had a hot flash, no night sweats, no weight gain, skin is plump, et cetera. Yeah. So that's a great question. Um, look at your family history. If you have a strong history of neurodementia, Alzheimer's, if you know you have the Alzheimer's gene, there's a great study you should read um, that looked at women who, who had the APOE gene for mm -hmm. Alzheimer's who were on hormone replacement therapy or, or birth control pills in perimenopause. They had higher brain volumes and higher cognitive scores than their counterparts who weren't on hormones in menopause. 
So it seems estrogen is, is protective against certain diseases, especially if you've got a strong family history of cardiovascular disease or your cholesterol is coming up out of nowhere. You haven't changed your diet, your exercise, and all of a sudden you're, you know, so menopause is a, you may miss out on the cardiovascular and, and cognitive benefits if you don't, even if you don't have a hot flash. Now, that being said, people who have severe symptoms have higher health risks. Huh. Okay. So if you're a super flasher, you are higher risk of lots of stroke. And I was a super flasher. Yeah, and my mom was too. And, and just recently, didn't a study or something just come out recently about the correlation between night sweats and severe night sweats, or maybe this has been for a long time. Maybe I just read it and heart attack, I think, yes. I think it was heart attack. And yeah. And gosh, I remember my mom going through it. And it's interesting because my mom was definitely in that age bracket of the, um, WHI and stuff, but luckily she had a really fantastic doctor and she stayed on until her breast cancer diagnosis, which was when she was like 71. Um, that's, the, that's when she got off of estrogen and it's funny, funny is the wrong word again, but I, I read, um, estrogen matters book, estrogen matters, which is amazing. And I recommend it to everyone, but it, it almost, and I might be interpreting it wrong, but it's almost like estrogen would be protective post breast cancer as well, except for, of course, that's a conversation with the oncologist, blah, blah, blah. But, um, it's been so demonized. It's incredible. So what the WHI showed, there were two arms, basically there were women who had uteruses and women who had had hysterectomies. Okay. Two groups. Right. The women who had uteruses were further divided into two subgroups. One of them got Primrin and Primpro. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the other one got placebo and with no uterus, you don't need the progestin. So they just got Primrin. Okay. Mm -hmm. And off they went. The Primarin only group had a decreased 20 to 30%. I forget the numbers risk of breast cancer, mm -hmm. new onset of breast cancer. And those that were diagnosed had a lower stage and a higher survival rate. Okay. Yeah. That held for, so on Prim Pro, they did see an increased risk. It went from four out of a thousand women per year to five out of a thousand women <laughs> right. per year. So that's the difference between absolute risk and relative risk. What got sent out in the papers was estrogen causes breast cancer. No, it's progestin. And that it had a 25% increased risk. That is a relative increased risk. Right. That's large populations. Right. You know, your individual risk was 0.08%. When we took a talk about female cancers, there's no association, actually birth control pills, a history of birth control pill use is protective against most ovarian cancers. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that takes your risk down. Um, we know from the WHI that any estrogen use is protective against colon cancer. They never talk about that. Okay. Mm -hmm. We know that estrogen and progesterone arm only had an increased risk of breast cancer and it was modest at best. There's no increased risk within five years of use. Okay. okay the first five years are free. Okay. Um, and then for uterine cancer, meaning endometrial cancer. So I'm not talking about a sarcoma. I'm talking about the most common gynecologic cancer, you know, is endometrial or and cervical, but, and no association with cervical cancer. That's a virus, right? Okay. And so the lining of the uterus, that endometrium, um, if you give a woman with a uterus unopposed estrogen, meaning estrogen alone, no progesterone, you will predispose her to endometrial cancer. Okay. okay so those of you who are getting estrogen in any form and you're getting a progesterone cream, you need to call your doctor immediately and ask to be switched to an oral pill because the creams are not going to be absorbed enough to give you that protection of the lining of the uterus. You're putting yourself at risk for cancer. This question is, I've heard that doctors should never give oral estrogen because it increases the risk of clots. Is that true? So um, the risk is modest. Okay. With oral, there is no increased risk of clotting with transdermal. Okay. So Okay. So it is what happens is anything we ingest orally, any medication, any food goes through your know, stomach, intestines, right? And then the portal circulation, there's special veins that go from the gut to the liver. Everything gets taken to the liver for processing. That is a normal part of our metabolism. When that bump of estrogen that you took orally hits the liver, it can upregulate your clotting factors. And so seven out of 10,000 women without MTH of, you know, without any inborn clotting defects will have a blood clot that didn't unless it's transdermal or transmucosal. So vaginal estrogen doesn't do it. Transdermal estrogen doesn't do it. Not to say you're never going to have a clot. You're still a woman with veins, right. you know, 
it's not, but it's not going to increase you over your baseline. So there's so many women who are, uh, who've been told or are under the impression that they've had a clot or they're carrying whatever genetic, you know, protein S, protein C, whatever, that they cannot ever do HRT. You shouldn't do oral. Okay. The chance of clotting is still very low, seven out of 10,000. But for that reason, I usually prescribe transdermal. Is it essential for all women who supplement with estrogen to also take progesterone? And Absolutely. If you have a uterus, okay. you don't have a uterus, it's a maybe. I usually start my patients on estrogen only and see how they do. If they're still having difficulty with sleep, um, racing thoughts, anxiety, then we may add in some nighttime progesterone um, for that. Okay. If someone is in menopause officially, i.e. no cycle for over a year, is it safe to take progesterone alone without taking estradiol for its benef benefits such as sleep, et cetera? So why are you not starting on estrogen? Mm -hmm. I mean, progesterone is what, what in the studies caused the breast cancer, not the estrogen. So right. if you think you're doing this, I mean, yes, it can be helpful. Absolutely. And it's very safe. You can do estrogen without you can't do estrogen without progesterone if you have a uterus now. Um, but if you have a Mirena IUD or, a, you know, a, um, an IUD with progesterone in it, you're covered. You don't need the extra progesterone. You're okay. okay. So a lot of breast cancer patients or people super high risk with genetic defects are choosing HRT with the IUDs because they're not getting the systemic progesterone that's higher risk. Oh. That's and they can protect the lining of their uterus. Okay. Yes, you can do progesterone as far as there's no blood clots or anything, but progestins is, is more likely to be related to breast cancer than estrogen. Okay. Vaginal estrogen. Why would I need to take vaginal estrogen on top of regular HRT? Because you have a vagina. <laughs> um, <laughs> Look, the more the merrier. If for a lot of women, they're not getting enough penetration of the tissues in the vagina, the bladder, the bladder neck from their systemic estrogen. Quite often, especially if they're sexually active, I've got to add vaginal estrogen to really get that tissue absorption. And anyone can use vaginal estrogen. Breast cancer, blood clots. If you have breast cancer right now, you can do vaginal estrogen. And it just kills me that women were denied this and then having horrific vaginal atrophy, you know, from their tamoxifen and all their treatments. And they're just like miserable and they can't have you know, sex is just a nightmare. And they, you know, that is completely treatable very safely with vaginal estrogen. Okay. So this is probably going to sound dumb. And this is actually coming from me. Why is it that if you're using a facial cream with, um, with this in it, that that is not systemic, but you can use transdermal gel or whatever. And do you know what I'm saying? The, like, the, I don't the, understand. The, 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 I, and I know that somebody has asked me that question and I'm like, I oh, don't actually know right. because one of right. the that has been said is, oh, don't worry. It's not systemic. Not that we should worry, but that has been presented, but then there are actual topical gels and creams that are supposed to be systemic. What's the difference? Oh yeah. Great question. So the devil's in the dose, ah. just think, just trying to penetrate that top layer of skin. That's all you're doing, right? Gotcha. Get to those receptors right in the skin. It's a micro dose compared right. to what is in those systemic preparations. Ah. Okay. And Devil's in the dose. So think about it. I, when I try to explain to patients, I'm like, it's like the cortisone, you pick up the cortisone 10, you know, cream that you can get from the grocery store versus a, you know, clobetazole, you right. know, that's like, that's like a match and a blowtorch. Right. And so, you know, like the difference between the strengths. So it really is the dosage, the strength. Ah, that much, 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 makes much, sense. much higher. Okay. Thank you. That, that has bugged me. And I honestly was like, I don't know. Why I mean, would that be? Yeah. So moving along to hair, can HRT reverse existing hair decline or just slow new decline? It depends. So hair loss has multiple reasons. Right. There could be nutrition deficiencies, genetics, hormones, uh, stress, you know, the, the PTSD kind of hair loss that we all went through with COVID. Right. Um, and so it depends. I have a whole YouTube video about hair loss, like medical reasons and different treatments, you know, everything from red light to PRP. So if it is hormonally related, it can help. What happens in menopause is, is I talked a little bit about, you know, we end up with sometimes male pattern baldness uh -huh. and what happens is, um, our estrogen levels greatly decline 
and our steroid hormone binding globulin declines as well. That is the, the little car, you know, it's a protein that holds onto our sex hormones and while they transport through the bloodstream. And so when they're free, they're active. And when they're bound, they, they're, they're not active. So when SHVG drops, your estrogen production drops, there's no estrogen anyway, but your testosterone, you're still making some in the adrenal gland and it becomes more active because it's right. as bound. Oh, yeah. That testosterone starts for some of us acting here. So I really think everybody could benefit if you're losing hair, thinning hair from Rogaine, you know, it okay. doesn't matter what the hair loss is from Rogaine or Minoxidil can mm -hmm. be helpful. It's something I've used for years, regularly, finally, finally, finally getting it all back. Um, and um, hormone therapy, you know, really being kinder to your hair. I've mm -hmm. really tried to be less aggressive with the hair techniques and uh, straightening and, and different things. So right. to my little hair follicles. So. This one's a good one. What What's the cause of waking between 2 and 4 a.m. night? Uh, Is this caused by low progesterone? They go through a whole thing, but let's let's talk about that because, boy, that's a thing. <laughs> Middle of the night awakenings are one of the hallmarks of menopause, you know, for people even who were good sleepers. And then all of a sudden it's like two, 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 three, 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 you know, and then you can't go back to bed. Your head's racing, all of that. So if you're untreated for your menopause, you really want to consider hormone replacement therapy because if you're not sleeping, if the quality of your sleep's not great, you're going to suffer on multiple levels. Your cortisol levels go up, your stress on your heart goes up, your ability to function and think during the day, like you get in this really negative feedback cycle. Mm -hmm. And so HRT can be amazing, but even with HRT, like for myself, I have got to get the sleep hygiene down. Like I've made a funny video where I cut the shoulders out of my nightgown, <laughs> you know, so sleeveless and, you know, chill that room down, get a chilling pad. If you need one, make sure you got fans and cold water, you know, don't limit the times you have to get up and pee. So if that means restricting fluid intake after a certain time, do it, you know, yeah, yeah. water at other times during the day, I would not get reliant on a lot of sleep aids. Those right. really, you're not getting quality sleep when you do that. I mean, occasional right. ambient, occasional things. Absolutely. We all have, you know, right. um, I wear a sleep ring to yeah. help me pack yeah. Other thing that I cannot do anymore is drink alcohol. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, if I choose to have wine, I am sacrificing my sleep and it is a conscious decision. There are so many things that sleep is so good for, it's so important for. Um, will you hit on magnesium? Because I know you've done yeah. how important that is as well. So we, as a, as a gender are not getting enough magnesium in our diets and I don't look at male studies. So you know, <laughs> they have plenty of people that take care of them. So when I talk about studies, I'm only looking at the ones on done on females. And I try to do the ones only done on females and menopause. Turns out we're not getting enough magnesium. We're not getting enough omega threes. We're not getting enough vitamin D. Magnesium has multiple functions in the body, including our brain. Mm -hmm. And so, so there's, we're, there's reversing a deficit. Okay. When we talk about vitamins, we're trying to get you out of a deficit. Okay. And then there's certain things that can be medicinal. So let me tell you what's not medicinal, like taking vi a vitamin C deficiency can lead to immune immunocompromise and you scurvy and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Taking mega doses of vitamin C does not give you superpowers. Okay. It's not medicinal over the recommended daily amount. Okay. So magnesium is a little different. Magnesium, we want to correct the deficit always, but it can be medicinal. Certain forms can give you an added benefit in higher doses without mm -hmm. being toxic. And so one of the things we know magnesium helps with is mental health, sleep, mm -hmm. calming. Um, so when my patients are coming in with sleep issues, even, even without HRT, I'm immediately going to magnesium l as my mm -hmm. To it's the one that studied the most in mental health and in sleep. Definitely my favorite too, the blood brain barrier. And um, I like it in uh, liposomal because it's easy, you know, just easy to take. Okay. So testosterone, I would love to know more about adding testosterone and what the benefits and side effects are. So, um, so you have to be careful. This is where I struggle a little bit with the BioT company because they make some very exaggerated claims that don't have a lot of clinical evidence to back them up. And they're also recommending super physiologic dosages right. again, without clinical evidence. Right. And so the higher you go physiologically, the more side effects you have. Mm -hmm. Like, and if you want to grow a beard, some women do, then that's, you know, so I, I'll often ask a patient who comes in and I'll check her blood level and it's 350, 400 that's transitioning levels. Right. Right. 
So is if that's what you want, I'm a hundred percent behind you, but I'm not the doctor for that. Like I didn't mean in transitioning from, you know, one gender to another. So, but when I put it to them that way, they're like, what? (laughs) And I'm like, yeah, I try to dose my patients if they want it. And I'll talk to you why I give it to physiologic, like higher end physiologic levels. So in our most randiest sexual state, our testosterone levels were never higher than 70. Right. That's that's high normal. If I had a person not on testosterone, a woman who came to me and her level was a hundred, I'm forced to look for a tumor. Right. Okay. Testosterone producer. Okay. That's how high that is. So let me give right. you a perspective. And so when I see a woman coming in at three, four hundred, I'm like, honey, are you okay? So hypoactive sexual desire disorder. It has been shown in a menopausal woman to be helpful. So remember, when we talk about sexual function in a woman, a woman comes to my office and says, I'm not happy. If you're not having sex and you're happy, that's okay. (laughs) That's okay. And so, but when she says, I'm not happy, I miss it. I want to want to want it. So you have to want to want, okay? In order for me to help you. Right. And so then we talk about the reasons and there's five buckets and they can overlap. So don't, you don't have to be pigeonholed into one relationship disorder. If you don't feel you have a great relationship, this is someone who's supportive of you. This is a constant battle outside of the bedroom. It's completely within your right to not want to have sex with that person, you know, that to not have intimacy with them. So make sure that that I can't medicate that. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> then we have desire the brain arousal, the pelvis, orgasm disorders, and then pain. Okay. Mm -hmm. If it hurts, we got to start there. Yeah. You got to fix the pain. Okay. Now desires what happens in the brain. Arousal is the physiologic response to a stimulus. Vagina Mm -hmm. elongates. We have more mucus production. The clitoris gets in the gorge, all the things. Okay. And then orgasm. So orgasmic and arousal disorders are totally separate treatments than testosterone. Testosterone seems to be good in a menopausal woman for desire only. Ah. If you're pure desire, it can be helpful and it doesn't work for everyone. Our desire is complicated. <laughs> a man's, I joke, I joke in my office, tends to be a light switch on and ours looks like the flight deck of a 747. Kelly <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, Casperson, who's in your area and wrote the book, um, you are not broken. If anyone is struggling with their sexual function, please read that book before you go to, to some wackadoodle who's going to medicate you into oblivion. Ah, okay, good. You know, good. Make That's sure amazing. you're pursuing the right path, you know, before ah. you further destroy your self-confidence. Okay. Uh, by try to get Medicaid for something that's not going to help what you really have. Okay, birth control, pregnancy, and HRT. Is it okay to take a low form of birth control so that estrogen doesn't deplete? Yes. So especially in early perimenopause, she's symptomatic one and she needs contraception. That's my go-to, you know, I'll do a very, very low dose. I'll try to find one with estradiol, but they aren't covered by insurance. Um, and so, um, or if she's, you know, like been on a birth control pill in the past that her body did well with, we'll go back to that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I try to do a low dose birth control pill early in the game. And then we kind of transition to the more traditional menopausal doses as she gets further along. Diet and weight. I seem to have gained a lot of belly fat since appro- approaching menopause. Is this my imagination? And what can I do about it? So there's two things that are happening and they're sometimes difficult to untangle. We're getting older, everything in our body, every cell in our body is getting older. And then we're also having accelerated endocrine aging through menopause. And so those, that one, two combo is leading to increasing inflammation levels. And when our inflammatory markers go up, we drive more fat to the abdomen. Another phenomenon that's happening is something called sarcopenia, which is the loss of muscle mass with age. We are, even though that scale is staying the same, hundred percent, unless you are doing, unless you're having 1.5 grams of protein, you know, per kilogram of lean body mass per day, and you're doing consistent resistance training with heavy weights, you are losing muscle and replacing it with fat. And then all of a sudden you're like, what the hell is happening to my tummy? Right. You know, and even the most disciplined dieter, you know, all of our lives we fought to be thin, right? Right. We're trying to be smaller. And now I'm like, what in the hell? We need to be stronger. Right. Yeah. Stop, sure. Let go of that. You know, you yeah. need muscle to be healthy. Right. Right. Dosing and duration. I've seen studies that have shown that HRT has the most benefits for about 10 years from the start of menopause. Is that true? 
So it, the benefit, the cardiovascular benefits, yes. The neurodegenerative benefits, yes. Yeah. So those benefits don't go away when you stop, okay? Mm-hmm. It depends on when you start. So it's called the healthy cell hypothesis. Okay. And I'm glad we brought this up. So estrogen is better about keeping a healthy cell healthy than reversing a disease process once it gets started. And in some cases can make it worse. Okay. And so if you start estrogen early enough, you will get those benefits and they will continue as long as you take it. But if you start more than about 10 years after your menopause, you've lost that potential benefit and you may even work, make a, a, a pre-existing condition worse. I know that there's a lot of people watching that are 10 years post menopause. Is there anything that they can do? As I have, as it's an individual decision. I sit down with the patients. We have a long discussion. If they come in, I had a patient come in at 62. Okay. She had a cardiac scan, totally negative. No history of Alzheimer's or dementia in our family. Completely healthy, functional. And she's like, I want it. Okay. I'm having flashes. I'm still having night sweats. I want this. I realize that I'm not going to get the cardiovascular benefits, but I'm certainly going to be able to sleep. And I was like, let's do it. Okay. So it's obvious it's case by case, but it does not mean just because you are 10 years or further post that you're just ixnate on this. You need to have a conversation with your doctor, testing, you know, anything like that. And then it's a possibility. Yep. Okay, good. Uh, perimenopause. If I'm 42 and don't have any symptoms, but want to prevent sy- symptoms, what would you recommend? So there, we know that certain nutritional patterns, um, you have an easier time with symptomatology. Okay. Women who have more of the Mediterranean or Galveston diet, we're very similar to Mediterranean. We're adding in fasting and, you know, mm-hmm. and some micronutrients basically. And so um, have less hot flashes and less symptomatology. And we know less symptoms, less cardiovascular risk. And so turns out that just that diet alone helps with cardiovascular risk as well. So, you know, everybody in the, in the wants a quick fix. And I, of course I do. If there was just one pill I could take that would like make everything better. And I could just at, feel 35 until I had a stroke at 90 and it was over, right. you know, so that would be amazing, but it's all about habits. It's all about patterns. Yeah. And so adopting these habits and patterns as soon as possible will ease you through this transition and keep you as healthy as possible. You know, it's funny because your book, The Galveston Diet, um, The Estrogen Matters and Atomic Habits were the three books that I was re- like in- uh-huh. interchangeably. And what you just said is pretty much atomic habits. It's like small habits over time make huge huge, um, you know, changes in your life or effects on your life. And, and obviously it's all kind of interplayed, especially when it comes to diet, exercise, and just small habits. So it's really, really good advice. Um, okay. What is the best moment, (laughs) boy, what is the best moment to start or even to start thinking about HRT? So, um, I think that every, you know, the new book I'm writing is really a a gift to a five-year-old you know, before it even starts that, you know, what's happening, you're prepared just as you would prepare your child for puberty. You've probably already started having the conversations, you know, she's starting mm-hmm. to have some mm-hmm. changes so that she's not blindsided. What's happening to our generation is we didn't know what the hell me right. I was a doctor and I couldn't, didn't realize that was being puzzle. You know, I'd always had a regular periods. I was off birth control pills. I was, you know, my brother just died. I was sweating, you know, and it took me like a few months to be like, oh my God. <laughs> Oh, menopause. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, I was 49 years old. And so, you know, I don't want another woman to go through that. I mean, I think if the, the we gaslight ourselves, you know, right. and yeah. so being informed, being prepared and as early as possible so that you're like, okay, you have a plan in mind. Like, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to talk to my doctor about. Here's how I'm going to arm myself with information. Um, so that, you know, the earlier you start and prepare, the better you're going to be. So um, a question about symptoms. I, I think that this is important to address is that you don't have to test for menopause. Can you explain that, how that works yeah. about symptoms and testing and all of that? Perimenopause is a clinical diagnosis. You talk to the patient, you believe the patient. Now I'll do blood work to make sure that a lot of things look like perimenopause, like PCOS or hypothyroidism or uh, vitamin deficiencies, depending on her symptoms. And so I'm testing for those things, but I rarely have to do a hormone test in perimenopause to make the diagnosis because 
Again, remember, it's pulsatile. We're fluctuating. In perimenopause, those those pulsatility goes crazy. At the EKG, you start having, you know, palpitations, basically. <laughs> and so, so a one-time blood urine saliva test is rarely, rarely going to be definitive. So you really have to understand the physiology of what's going on. And unfortunately, we're doing a terrible job educating our providers. So they're relying on these companies who are trying to say, oh, take this test, spit in this thing, pee in this cup, and we're going to be able to tell you all this magical stuff about your body. And there's just no validity there. So right. I'm just trying to save people money, you know? Post-menopause, sometimes I'll get the blood work just to prove, okay, you're really done. Or if you have an IUD or an ablation or a hysterectomy, you don't have that period to guide you. And right. so for those women, I'll always get the, the okay. test. 95% of women will stop having a period between 45 to 55, okay. 95%. Perimenopause begins seven to 10 years before that. So I know when they're walking in the door, right? You know, right. Um, when they're complaining, yeah. bump, 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 I'm like, there's a pretty good chance this constellation of symptoms is related to peri perimenopause. Right. Let's treat. Heart disease. What's the connection between heart disease and menopause? So we know that um, the risks of cardiovascular disease go up with the menopause transition. It's linear. And mm -hmm. so where we really enjoyed low cardiovascular disease risk pre-menopause, it goes up to a little bit higher than a man's. Okay. And um, right at the menopause transition. And so cholesterol dyscrasia is happening, you know, all of a sudden you're like going every year, getting your lipids done and boom, you know, all of a sudden at 52, you've got high cholesterol. You're like that's menopause, right? Mm -hmm. Your insulin resistance goes up, your inflammation markers go up, you know, all of those things. So hormone therapy seems to be protective for a lot of that. If you start young. I think that that is, I, I have said, I am so thankful that I am this age learning this stuff because I, I think to myself, you know, I, I think back to the people who had to be going through this after the WHI, five years after. And I just, that to me, it's, it's such a disservice to so many women, but I mean, yeah, we left now, an entire generation of women in the Yeah. Day. And you're right about riding the ship. It's going to take a long time, but that's why to me, these conversations are so important. Okay. Osteoporosis. What is the link between osteoporosis and menopause? <laughs> that's a huge question. <laughs> that's well, it's a hundred percent link. Yeah. So we peak our bone density at around age 35. Okay. Uh, ish and um, we start losing bone. So, so we remodel bone every day of our lives. We are chewing up bone and laying down new bone like Pac-Man, right? Mm -hmm. Chewing and pooping. <laughs> and so we chew faster and we poop slower as we get older. Aging is par a part of this. And then you hit menopause and it just ramps up. Right. And so um, HRT is one of the best preventative treatment measures for osteoporosis, but I cannot tell you Bone density is related to muscle mass. Right, the right. muscular unit cannot be ignored. Right. And weight bearing exercise is huge, huge, huge here. So if you had the grandma who looked like this, yeah. who crumpled, you know, you cannot take this for granted. Push to go pay for an out of pocket bone density test if it won't be covered by your insurance. Know your numbers because once you get that diagnosis, everything's covered. Right. Uh, and, you know, all my friends who are orthopedic surgeons who are focusing on this are like, this discussion needs to start in your twenties, right? You know, with your kids lift weights. Okay. Last question is, well, we had actually, I should say, we probably had about a hundred more questions, but this is the last question for today. Side effects of HRT. Are there any side effects of HRT? Yeah. And they're annoying. It's annoying. So, so red flags with HRT, if you develop new onset headaches or any visual changes, that is a huge stop now, call your doctor immediately. Okay. That is the brain thing going on. And that's very rare, but that is like, stop. Um, things that pay, annoy patients, scare patients, breast tenderness, ah. usually self-limited. And I warn every single patient, you 40% chance you're going to have bleeding. Nothing's wrong with you. We are stimulating tissue that bleeds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it usually is self-limited. If it persists over a couple, three months, we'll make some changes to the hormone levels to see if we can get this to stop, but you're not dying. And it does not require, if it's within the first six months of therapy, it does not require biopsy, workup, treatment, anything. I cannot tell you how thankful I am that you were here today. I really appreciate your time. And I know everyone is going to be, this is just fantastic information. I'm going to put 
everything about you in the <laughs> description box, all of your social media, um, your book. I can't wait for your new book. Um, and maybe I can have you back after, cause I know you're going to be pretty busy for a while. And, um, I just, I gotta say thank you. And thank you so much for, I know my community, like you're a superstar in there. I am not kidding. It was like Dr. Haver and the, off to the races. <laughs> so I really, really appreciate your time. You're so welcome. All right. Bye everybody. Bye. I hope you enjoyed my discussion with Dr. Mary Claire Haver. I do hope that you will leave a kind comment down below. Tell her thank you. I also hope you will go follow her on all of her social platforms, sign up for her newsletter, just really support her because people like her, women like her, we need to lift them up because they are doing some good work for us. I really hope that this was helpful. I hope you're having a wonderful day and I will talk to you in my next skincare video. Take care.